Hi everyone, my name is Shannon Johnson Friesen. Uh, I'm the pastor of Stonehouse Covenant Church in Steinbach, Manitoba, so a sister church of Erickson Covenant Church. It's wonderful to be with you today and to bring you something from God's Word. Um, I hope you are having a good summer. I hope you're finding some rest and uh, I follow Tom, Pastor Tom, on Strava. It's a running app, and um, he posts pictures sometimes, and you certainly live in a beautiful place. Um, I love uh, seeing the views, the vistas um, from wherever he's been running. Uh, our beauty here is different in the prairies. Uh, we have a lot of sky, and the fields right now are bright yellow, the canola fields are bright yellow, the corn is pretty high already. Um, it is also beautiful. God has created a beautiful world. So I'm hearing through Pastor Tom that you are exploring texts about the Holy Spirit this summer and asking some good questions like, why would the Holy Spirit come and how can we be filled with the Spirit and how does the Spirit help people find Jesus? Today we're going to ask another question, specifically, how does Jesus talk about the Spirit? And we're going to be looking at John 14. So if you'd like to follow along in your Bibles, um, which I highly recommend, uh, please open them to John 14. And before we start, uh, let's pray together. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this space that we are sharing. We invite you to speak to us through your word and to shape our thoughts and our attitudes and our perception um, of our lives and of the world and um, the places you've called us to live and be and work and serve and grow. Holy Spirit, would you meet us in the ways that, um, that meet us as individuals? And would you meet us as your body, your church? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So John 14 has Jesus telling his disciples, I'm leaving and you can't come with me. After spending the better part of three years together, following him through Galilee and Judea and Samaria, they were going to have to say goodbye. We can imagine how troubled the disciples would have been when Jesus said this. Following him had become their whole life, and life, as they'd come to know it, was apparently going to change drastically. You know those kind of life events where there's a before and an after? where on the other side of whatever it is, life looks different, you look different, and you can never go back to the way it was before. This was shaping up to be one of those. You hear in their questions um, following his announcement, this low-level anxiety. This is ending? Then what, Jesus? You can almost hear the echo of something they'd said before. Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. You can imagine how Jesus would have felt too, knowing his separation from them was imminent and how much they still needed him. You can imagine how intentional he would have been to prepare them, saying the last, most important things. That's what we get, I think, in his last conversation with them in the upper room in John 14 to 17. He was orienting them so that in the after, they'd be able to find some footing. These words would be something to hold on to when life as they knew it was no more. And you know what? They're the same for us. Something to hold on to. They can give us footing in our everyday lives, but they can also root us when the storms of life hit us, reminding us who God is and who we are, what God is doing, how God is showing up, and that we can trust him. Jesus teaching on the Spirit here, the way God continues to be present with us and among us and through us is central to these famous last words of his. John 14 contains the highest concentration of this Spirit theology. While chapters 15 to 17 flesh it out, they add nuance. 
So uh, for a number of years, um, my husband and my sons have really been into fishing, like, like let's say 10 years or something like that. And kind of recently, like in the last like four years maybe, uh, my husband has gone up north and he's done, he's a construction, he does construction. So he did some construction on a site at a like fly-in fishing lodge. Um, and through that experience, he actually learned how to make like amazing um, fish, like like fried fish. And uh, through some other friends of ours, um, we got this amazing recipe for a fresh salsa for these fish tacos. So I'll just describe it for you. Uh, it's just simple ingredients. So you grill corn, like corn on the cob ideally, and pineapple together. Um, and then you chop them up very finely and then you chop up some cucumber and you kind of like put that all together and then you add cilantro and you add lime juice and uh, you make this um, really good um, like dressing I guess to put over the vegetables and fruit and uh, it's so it's lime juice and cumin and olive oil um, and together this salsa um, these these ingredients just combine and they're so perfect it's so flavorful and delightful and you top the taco the fish taco with it you add a little chipotle mayo and it is like um, some of the best food you ever eat I say that about a lot of food but anyway that's uh, a little picture of, of what I'm gonna describe here. So when you read about all that Jesus says and does in the book of John, what he's revealed about himself and the Father, it's like the author has been laying out a bunch of different ingredients on a table. And John 14 is when we see Jesus finally bringing them together in a bowl and they're culminating in this incredibly flavorful dish, sort of like the salsa I just described. Each ingredient plays a vital role. They're meant to be tasted and experienced all together. So what are the ingredients in the bowl of John 14? Well, we have Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Those are sort of the main ingredients, but then we also have his word and we have love. He talks about it a lot in John 14 and his disciples, us. And together, these ingredients reveal why, even when life as we know it comes unraveled, that we can plant our feet. The truths that we can root ourselves in, that's, that's what these ingredients do. When they're all combined together in this bowl, it gives us a place to uh, be rooted. We're going to read and experience uh, the chapter all at once. Um, this bowl full of ingredients and then we'll look at how each ingredient plays a part in the whole and how the spirit particularly is woven into all of it how Jesus builds our understanding our theology of God's spirit but before we read uh, there are a couple things to say Jesus talked about God as father when he was on earth and it's especially emphasized in John and this imagery is hard for some people for various reasons. You might be one of them. Um, you might have someone in your life for which this imagery for God is hard. Um, it's notable that father language for God is sparse in the Old Testament. And it's also notable that the Old Testament uses both mother and father imagery for God. So what does that mean? That means that Jesus' emphasis on God as his and our Father is intentional. This doesn't mean that Jesus is saying God is male. Sexuality is a created entity. We know that most creatures and humans and even some vegetation are created male or female. God does not fit in those created categories. But Jesus does call God Father. Why do you think this is? Could it be that he's affirming the personhood of God and is also revealing the relational connection between us and God as a parent-child relationship? I think this is likely. I'm a mother. Um, and I know that being a parent is one of the strongest bonds um, with another human that we can experience as a human. Um, 
I think that Jesus using uh, this father language for God is his way of describing the kind of bond that God has with him and with us. The bond which we know through experience. As Jesus calls God Father, he gifts us with a frame of reference. God's love for us is that strong and that intimate, that intuitive and that unbreakable. It's a love that never quits, um, that can't. Jesus calling God Father affirms and illuminates God's love. The second thing I want to say before we read is that references to the Holy Spirit as Him in John 14 are a reflection of the limitations of the English language. How do you express the personhood of someone in the Trinity in English without a male or a female pronoun, when our only choices are he, she, or it? In Greek, the pronoun for the spirit is neutral, but translated into English, it feels really impersonal for someone who has agency and who teaches and helps and gives gifts and comforts. Jesus talks about the spirit as a person. So this is where I invite you to hold the pronouns with open hands and look instead at the persons Jesus is describing here in this chapter. And then focus on this incredible intermingling of ingredients. Jesus, the Father, the Spirit, Jesus' words, his disciples, and love. Friends, we're meant to understand them in relationship, to experience them together. So John 14 begins and ends the same way, with Jesus saying, don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus knew his disciples' world would be completely disrupted by his death, that life as they knew it would be no more, even after his resurrection and ascension. And yet, he says to them, don't let your hearts be troubled. And he's saying it to us too. And in the bowl of John 14, we find out why. So I'm going to read it for us. Um, it's 27 verses. That's how, that's how long I'm going to, um, that's how long it is. And uh, I invite you to read it with me if you have your Bibles with you. Otherwise, you can listen. Jesus says, let your hearts, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that you can be where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you'd known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you've seen him. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else, believe on account of the works themselves, the things that I've done. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these they will do, because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, and that, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I'll do it. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. And I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world can't receive because it can't see him, nor does it know him. You know him, 
for he dwells with you and will be in you. I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet in a little while, the world won't see me anymore, but you will see me. And because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you're in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, this is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and show myself to him, manifest myself to him, to them. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us, that you will show yourself to us, but not to the world? And Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, they will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. It's beautiful. Whoever does not love me does not, and um, whoever does not love me, sorry, I'm losing my place, does not keep my words. That's interesting. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear isn't mine, but it's the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I don't give to you like the world does. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be afraid. And we'll end there. What is so striking uh, about this bowl full of ingredients? If we could sum it up in like one sentence, what would it be? I wonder if it could be something like this. Even though he leaves, he doesn't leave us alone. We are not alone and we are loved. That's what he's saying. How does Jesus explain how we're not alone? Let's look at the ingredients in the bowl. Jesus is the first ingredient in the bowl of John 14, and his words are another. He tells his disciples that he's the way to the Father, that he's the truth, the one who clearly reveals who God is and what God is doing and what God wants for the world. He also tells us that he's the life, the one who has become one of us, human, and is at the same time God, who because of this saves us from sin and makes eternal life possible. We learn that through other texts, other, other gospel texts, but also throughout the Old, Old Testament, there's like inclinations toward that, and then also um, throughout the rest of the New Testament. So we, we are told this, um, and, it, and it's explained to us in other places that he's the life as well, and he's making that statement. Here, um, Jesus uh, is, is light with no darkness. That's life, right? Light with no darkness, if you need a metaphor. He also tells us that the words he speaks have been given to him by his Father who dwells in him, and that they, these words are for us. And then he extends an invitation to trust him and his words. The Father is another ingredient in the bowl of John 14. And this is so interesting and amazing for Jesus to reveal the Father by saying, look at me. To see me is to see the Father. I am in the Father and the Father is in me, he says. This is such a bold claim and an incredible gift. The Jesus we meet in the pages of the gospel is God in the flesh. God seen and touched and heard. No one else in history can say that. Um, you, you probably can picture this, right? Um, a son being a reflection of his father. 
Um, my son, uh, my middle son especially, like, is so much like my husband, Tim, like, um, in build and in personality and in the ways that they interact um, with, with me, with others. It's so interesting to watch your son reflect um, his father. And, and this is a picture of, of um, what Jesus is describing here. Jesus also talks about going to his father's house to prepare a place for his disciples. So he's going home. I think about a kid going home um, from school, like from college to home or something. <laughs> I don't know why. That's just what comes to my mind. And uh, so he's going home and someday his disciples will join him there. That's the picture he gives us. It's as if he's taking our hand and taking the hand of God, and he's bringing them together. He's bringing us close by what, by what he's saying here um, and what he's doing. Friends, what he says here is crucial for understanding who God the Father is. This must guide and inform the way we read the rest of Scripture. We must learn to see and know God through Jesus to allow the Jesus we meet in the Gospels to help us interpret what the rest of Scripture is saying about God, what God said and what God did. Jesus says to see him at work is to see the Father at work. To hear him speak is to hear the Father speak. Jesus uses this in language to describe this intimate connection between him and the Father. And this leads us to the next ingredients in the bowl of John 14, the Holy Spirit and love. Jesus tells his disciples that when he returns to the Father, he's going to send them a helper, the Spirit of Truth, he calls them, he calls him, <laughs> pronouns. And then he tells the disciples that they know the Spirit already because he dwells with them and will be in them. And then in the next breath, he says that he won't leave them as orphans, but will come to them. And I think we're allowed to read those two sentences together. The scriptures give us that, that kind of permission um, so that we can recognize that Jesus saying he won't leave them, he will come to them, um, is connected to the Spirit. So he comes to us through his Spirit. The Spirit is present in and with Jesus, so like, think about his baptism for a second. The Spirit descends and rests on Jesus. We kind of get a picture of it being on his shoulder or something. Um, and the Spirit is also present in and with the Father. The Father sends the Spirit, Jesus tells us. So somehow, the Spirit who dwells in and with both the Father and the Son, um, who bonds them together, so to speak, is also poured out on us. I am in my Father, and you're in me, and I'm in you, Jesus says. He gives a gift to us here, naming that this same Spirit that unites him and the Father also unites them to us. The word paraclete, that Jesus uses here translates broadly as friend, but the underlying sense of the word is helper and comforter and advocate. And depending on your translation, it could show up as any one of these. Really, it's describing a true friend. Jesus associates the Spirit with truth, just like he is. He associates the Spirit with love and also with his presence. He says the Spirit comes and lives within us, that the Spirit teaches us and helps us see and moves us into love, not just affection, but action. Love is always an action. The Spirit's presence manifests in love. That's the sense that we get in John 14. By the Spirit, God draws near to us. Jesus draws near to us. The in language he uses implies this continuing relational connection, though Jesus is not present with us physically. 
I won't leave you orphaned. I will come to you, he says. I'll even reveal myself to you in the love that manifests as you keep my word, in the love that flows out of you. That's how he's revealing himself. I'm in my Father, and you are in me, and I'm in you. We're not alone. You are not alone. The Holy Spirit joins us to God, and to the Father, and to Jesus. These were some of the last things that Jesus left with his disciples. He wanted them and us to know these truths. They are words of comfort. They're why we can say, I'm leaving. Don't let your hearts be troubled. So uh, Tim and I have some friends in town, and their circumstances are dire. I'm not going to go into any detail. Um, we had the chance to sit with them for a couple hours one evening about a month ago, and it was interesting to observe that they, at the moment, are not rooted in these realities that Jesus is describing in John 14. Um, they are church people. We met them at church. Um, they're not part of Stonehouse, but just long time, like, friends, acquaintances, um, just being in the same community and our kids growing up together and stuff. They're about our age. And um, they're not rooted in these realities. They're not rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ, um, in the hope that we have um, of eternity with God and with one another. They're not rooted in the realities of God's presence with them in the midst of their suffering or God's love for them. Um, whether they've forgotten or they never heard it clearly or somehow their understanding of God has been so intertwined with religion, like the shoulds and should nots, that they can't separate them, I'm not sure. We didn't get that far in our conversation. But the story that they're telling themselves um, currently is that they are forsaken by God. Nothing could be further from the truth. God is near. Jesus um, says as much in this bowl of John 14. But we read it other, other places too. But sometimes we live within this fallacy, this false narrative that what we're going through, uh, when we're going through the hardest things, that we are forsaken by God, that we are forgotten and alone, that God has more important things to focus on or something. I have definitely been there. Um, have you? <laughs> Some of us have. The scriptures reveal that we are never alone, that God is with us, that God is always near, and especially near to those who are suffering from loss, um, from illness, from... from uh, so many varieties of, of different ways that we suffer in the world. Um, he's especially near to the oppressed and the brokenhearted and the burdened. Um, God would be near to his disciples in the loss that they were going to experience, uh, that Jesus was preparing them for. Um, not just the loss from his death, um, that was a couple of days, and then he rose, right? And um, in that, they experienced something um, that the, they had never experienced, that no one else really experiences, right? That their friend, um, their teacher came back to life, but, but Jesus is preparing them for what's coming after that. When he leaves and, uh, and he sends his spirit, but he's not present the same way that he's been present. I think uh, something that I'd love us to be able to walk away with here is like recognizing that the circumstances of life, um, the circumstances that life hands us, uh, do not tell the story of God's protection or lack of it, God's presence or lack of it, or God's love for us or the lack of it. We live in a broken world um, and God shows up in the midst of it through Jesus, through the Spirit, and through one another. Friends, we are seen and known and loved 
God is with us and for us, and he works through us to love one another. That's part of John 14 too, is like Jesus connecting this to love. This, this uh, I don't have a good word for it, but like this mingling of relationships between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and then us as well. And love is somehow woven into that. Um, and, and even as we minister to one another, that is God ministering to us through one another. Um, and, and that is how God loves the world as well. So I'm curious um, how these truths connect to your life. And we obviously won't be having a conversation about this here and now, um, but I'm curious how this theology that Jesus is handing us of the Father and the Son and the Spirit and, and His Word and love and, and us, how that um, connects to your life. Does it, does it help root you in some way? Maybe you walked in with being rooted in those truths. Maybe this is a good reminder. I'm not sure where you're at, but um, what does it look like for you to walk through your life being rooted here, knowing that you're not alone, that Jesus has promised his spirit and sent his spirit and that his spirit is present. God is present with you as you are walking through your life. What does it look like for you to walk through your life being rooted here? These are the ingredients in the bowl of John 14. Jesus and his word, the Father, the Spirit, love, and us. And in their convergence and intermingling, Jesus provides orientation for his disciples. He was leaving, but they wouldn't be left alone. The most beautiful aroma arises out of the bowl. God is with us, our helper and teacher and comforter and advocate and friend. We're not alone. Let not your hearts be troubled, Jesus says. Trust in God. Trust also in me. At the very end of the chapter, he says this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. May God's word make its way into your um, very being today um, and into mine. May we be able to um, hold these truths and plant our feet here. Thanks for allowing me to be with you today um, and blessings as you go from here.